When I was a child, uh, at eight years old, I learnt this definition of God in the Roman Catholic Catechism. The question was, what is God? And the answer, quick as a flash, with no sort of perturbation at all, came, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I have to say at eight, that didn't mean much to me. And I still find it a rather arid and pompous definition, but I also believe that now that it's incorrect. It's incorrect in thinking that it's possible simply to draw breath and define a word that literally means to set limits upon a reality that must go beyond everything we can think and know. Um, what strange creatures we are. We have the ability to think and to create extraordinary technology and yet we are beings full of fear, full of sorrow, as well as great joy. We're divided among ourselves. We have a brain, a reptilian brain, at the base of our, right in the heart of our uh, cranium. Uh, we've inherited it from our reptilian ancestors, which is all about survival. And yet, too, we also have developed this uh, neocortex, which enables us to stand back from that, reflect, and create all the things we have created. And the worst things happen when that uh, reptilian brain gets married with our um, thinking brain uh, to create great harm in the world. Uh, we've developed technology able to wipe out our planet. Uh, we are constantly aware of our own extinction and have to live with that. And that can render so much of what we do meaningless. So we are meaning-seeking creatures, too. Uh, and if we fail to find some kind of significance in our lives, we can fall very easily into despair. And that is why, from the very beginning of human history, as far as we know it, um, we have created works of art at the same time as we've created uh, religions to give us some sense that despite all the depressing evidence to the contrary, our lives have some kind of meaning and value. And the two are linked, as we'll see, art and religion. You were raised in the Roman Catholic tradition. And at the age of 17, you decided that you wanted to be a nun. Hmm. I entered at a very unfortunate age. I was far too young to make that kind of decision. I was a child and much younger in many ways, less streetwise than a 17-year-old would be today. Um, and this was the early 60s before the Beatles. I, I, the Beatles, we have a, 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 an English poem that says sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me. And I entered in 1962. Uh, so I really missed the whole thing, and I left in 1969 without ever, ever having heard of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, so I missed all that sort of empowerment of youth. Um, but, but it's turned out to be a disappointment in the end. Not a disappointment. No. I felt a failure. A failure? A failure. I, I, I came you sensed you had failed? Yes, I felt it for many years. Uh, I was un completely unable to pray. Um, and I used to, we used to have to meditate in the morning for half an hour, an hour every day morning at six o'clock to seven. Yes. And you know what an adolescent is like. I mean, all we wanted to do was sleep, you know, that heavy sleep of teenagers. And there we were. And I would just kneel down and, oh, my mind would be off, skittering down every aisle away. Um, let's go back, right back to the, one of the first recorded documents of human history. And I'm thinking, of course, about the great cave paintings. The, they are deep in the earth. And at the beginning of your experience in most of these labyrinths, you go down uh, for a long time before you see a single painting. 
and enter into a place where the sun has never shone and where the darkness is absolute, so absolute that it seemed that any kind of orientation with the outside world, visitors say, is, is sort of obliterated. You are disoriented by this darkness. That's an important point. And then think of the effort of some of these labyrinths. Uh, you have to journey for a mile underground dangerously uh, before you get to the, to the first paintings or the central sanctuary. There's one uh, up in the Pyrenees where you had the, the, to get to the main hall, people had to crawl uh, for at least half a mile through a tunnel a foot high in pitch darkness. Uh, bef uh, feeling and people who did this in, when these caves were discovered said the terror of this, the utter darkness, the feeling of the earth, are, you know, absolutely on the, pressing you down. And then you came into the main hall and it felt like a liberation. And there were these extraordinary, not paintings in this instance, but engravings, including the engraving of a large half man, half beast and uh, beings r playing the flute. So dancing perhaps went on there. People dressed in animal skin. Uh, a sense that the animal and the, the hunter and its prey were one and the same. Um, so you're separating yourself in some sense from the world outside and learning to look and experience in a different way. And it's hard work. It's not just a question of wandering into a church and singing a couple of hymns or wandering into an art gallery looking and saying very nice to and having a, a, a cup of coffee. You know at the end of the symphony at, in a concert hall, uh, when the last notes die away, there is often a pregnant, very full beat of silence until the applause begins. And good theology should help us to live in that moment of silence. Uh, not answering our questions, but leading us there. The medievals let's, uh, ha, used to call that intellectus. They said we have ratio in our minds. And there is that moment in our minds where we tip over into unknowing and transcendence. And that is what they call the intellectus. Uh, when you hear Christian fundamentalists uh, arguing about scripture, uh, they'll often quote chapter and verse, and it often sounds like a kind of tennis match that someone will uh, serve, uh, quoting John 3, 18, and his opponent will biff back with Matthew 2. Well, there are competitions in this. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, uh, but, but until the uh, uh, invention of printing made it possible for everybody to own his or her Bible. Mm. And until the modern uh, phenomenon of near-universal literacy enabled everybody to read their Bibles, nobody read their scripture in that way. Mm. And I was brought up a Catholic, and we read our scriptures, as had been the case right up uh, through until the Reformation, in an allegorical way. Mm. And we listened to our scripture, read to us in Latin, in a liturgical setting. We knew what it meant, we could follow it along, in our, but the, the, the Latin chant was part of it. And you had a very different relationship with your scripture uh, than, than, is, than, than is possible now. And the same with the Quran. You, Quran means recitation. You listen to it, you're not supposed to start at the last thing you should do is start at page one and plod through to page 132. Mm. It's not meant to be like that. Uh, what we chanted in the convent according to Gregorian chant, that cadence uh, and the Latin. And it was very puzzling to us nuns when we suddenly started chanting the Psalms in English. The Psalms are sometimes rather violent and frightening. And suddenly, what, what, when we'd said, sang, Deus frangere dentes in ore suo, that meant it was quite different when we were chanting, oh God, smash their teeth in their mouths. <laughs> um, and, 
And we were just paralysed with nervous giggles. I mean, these, two, these well-bred, polite English ladies. Uh, oh, God, smash their teeth in them. I mean, it was just uh, devastating to us. Uh, and, you know, th th that somehow uh, this is a new, and we're having a new relationship to mm. our scripture. And we should realise that, that, uh, you know, it's a new and interesting way but it's made scripture a bit more problematic to us. The Bible is, is a difficult document, a mm. set of documents, rather. Religion should lead to tenderness and empathy. It's not that they're all the same. They're not all the same. My life as a historian of religion would be a great deal easier if all the religions were the same. Uh, they are not. They are extraordinarily different. Each has fascinating differences and significant important differences. Each has its own particular genius, each its special flaws or failings. Uh, but what they do all say is that there's something wrong with your religion if it doesn't issue in compassion. I can have faith that moves mountains, says St. Paul. I can give my body to be burned. I can give all that I have to the poor, but if I lack charity, it will do me no good at all. Uh, not one of you can be a disciple, said the Prophet Muhammad, unless he desires for his neighbor what he desires for himself. When Confucius was asked by his disciples, Master, which of your teachings can we put into practice all day and every day? He said, Shu, likening to the self. Do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Look into your own heart. Discover what gives you pain. And then refuse, if you can, uh, to inflict that pain under any circumstance on anybody else. The golden rule, which each of the great faiths has developed. And notice Confucius said all day and every day. I don't know about in Holland, but we have, we often say in England when we've done something nice for somebody, we say, well, that's my good deed for the day. As though we can then return for the next 23 hours uh, to our ordinary lives of spite and conceit and greed and unkindness. Uh, no, all day and every day. And if you did that all day and every day, you would be in a state of ecstasis. Uh, stepping outside the ego, which holds us back from the divine. Often our religions, just like our secular ideologies, can harden our hearts against the other and give us a sense of righteousness. Uh, whereas the trick uh, for f to be fully humane is to have that tenderness that the Bushmen have for their animal, that the Greeks had. Uh, when uh, they wept for Oedipus or that we should have when we look at uh, the suffering not only of the flayed Christ on the crucifix but on, at our fellow human beings. Thank you. Do we need religion? We just do it. It's like art. We do it. Um, and it's like art. You can have very good art and you can have horrible art. Uh, you can have daubs, and you can have social, you know, too ideologically driven art like that, sort of social, so, socialist realist art. Um, but we do religion. Now, that our ideas of religion change, uh, but the search for meaning goes mm. on.